From the birth of the early church to the birth of our nation and throughout its history, the church has always been the heart of a community. Jesus established the church and proclaimed in Matthew 16 that what He built, even the gates of hell, will not tear down. God's plan for the church has always been that it will endure and abound. And as a mandate, Jesus called the unity of believers to come together as the church. Because within this context of community, we carry on His work to serve the lost, broken, poor, and marginalized. It is in this community that we gain new perspective of God's dwelling place. God now dwells in us and with us, and collectively we create a place for people to come together. But just as the temple was threatened in the Old Testament, with each generation we see growing indifference and hostility towards the church. And as people lose hope, a church dies and its community is forever changed. As churches all over are struggling to keep doors open, there is a call to action for the rest of us to save the local church. At Sandals Church and the Rogo Foundation, we honor the call. Here are two of those stories. Over the last several decades, churches have been closing their doors at a staggering rate. It's been reported that 65% of churches in America are in a state of plateau or decline. So the reality is our culture is complex more than ever and it's changing faster than ever. And a lot of churches are struggling keeping up. The statistics say that the, the church is really losing the battle in America. Millennials are fleeing the church. Thousands per week, per month, church attendance is on the decline. Approximately 10,000 churches will close their doors this year alone. The people in the community are struggling with unemployment. There's thousands of church buildings around the country that are broken down because there's no money left, there's no people left in the church, the building is falling down. There's very little life in so many of the churches around America. The reality is the church in America is in trouble. I'm coming to you right now from a place that was a church where people gathered, uh, people met and people worshiped. But take a look at it. It's falling apart, it's run down and literally full of weeds and boards and no people. And this is right here in Southern California. And this is the condition of many, many churches today. And the problem is simple. Number one, literally a lack of leadership. People don't know how to reach young people today. Millennials are leaving the church at an incredible rate. And number two, just a lack of authenticity. And really what we need is a wave of a church committed to being real so we can turn this around. I came here as pastor in 1995, and it was myself, my wife Karen, my son Chris, my daughter Jen, and I came as the first time I'd ever been a lead pastor, and so I was coming into a church with some history, founded in 1925. My first board, everybody on the board had been here 20, 30, 40 years, and so they brought me in to bring some change and new life, and that was a tug of war from the start church had lots of pillars. They fought change. They fought everything. Might say they needed a pet rock to argue with. And so there came a point on a Saturday night in October 1999 when I said to my wife, I'm done. I've preached everything I know how to preach. I've led, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've done everything I know to do. And it's time for somebody else to come to this church and it's time for me to go somewhere else. When Pastor Paul went to bed that night, he raised his hands to the ceiling and said, Lord, it's your church. If you want to do something with it, you do it. Two hours later, Paul received a call that would change everything. One of the pillars of the church said to me, Pastor, the church is on fire. And I was pretty sure that was not a Pentecostal prayer meeting. And so my wife and I jumped in the car, drove down here, and we were standing out in the courtyard as 40, 50 foot flames came right out of the top of this building. It looked like a Polynesian pavilion on fire. And as I was standing there, I sensed the Lord say to me, any questions? And as I sensed God say to me, any questions? My wife looks at me and she goes, you can't leave. Listening to the voice of God, Pastor Paul and North Point began the long, hard journey of reconstruction. 
Three years into the multi-million dollar project, the unthinkable happened to our country, the terrorist attacks on September 11th. As a result, North Point's insurance company declared bankruptcy, paying out claims related to the attacks. This meant there was no money for the completion of the church. In a poor city with a failing economy, the bank loan of $1.6 million set the tone for mere survival. We worked as hard as we knew how to work. We made the best decisions we knew how to make. And I think we felt like we were a, a hamster on a wheel. You know, I think we felt like we were climbing that greased flagpole and that we were just in a hole for us, primarily financial, that we just could not dig out of. Well, a little history of Amethyst Bible Church. We were originally West Side Church of Christ, became Redlands Bible Church, and then became Amethyst Bible Church. I've been going off and on to that church since I was 17 years old been on many different levels of boards and worship team, children's ministry, done a little bit of everything at the church, and my husband and I did it all together. I became the president of the board the year after we had to let our pastor go. As each year went on, we had fewer and fewer and fewer folks that um, were still committed to the church. And it was hard because we'd been there long enough and that, that, was, that was our church and we weren't gonna let it go. And you know, we didn't know what to, what do you do? You know, you cry out to God and say, what, what should we do? We tried everything we could think of to bring people in. The emotions were very high. We were doing okay for a while, but um, finances were going down and there were only a few families in the church that were keeping the church afloat. The church was small. We had about 60 people, but only 30 coming. People were not wanting to tithe. Some people just didn't have the money to tithe. Um, and how do you reach out to people? How do you get people in? We tried everything, it seems like. That was the thing that we just could never figure out. You know, it's like, God, what do you want us to do? We don't want to lose this place. We don't, you know, we think we're called to be here. There's people we need to reach. All, you know, it's all our friends and family. You know, what, what do we need to do to make this work? And we talked about, I, it, we just didn't understand what, could, what would happen. Would we actually just shut the doors and turn off the lights and hand the bank the keys and say, we just can't do this anymore? I don't know that I ever completely lost faith that the church would survive. I just had no idea how it was going to survive. So many churches find themselves in a spot where they don't know what to do. Either it's a senior pastor that's sunsetting their career and they're struggling. They're not sure how to turn the church around. Uh, you may have an elder board or a pastoral search committee that's looking for a new pastor and they can't find one. So many churches are in a spot where they don't have enough money to pay the right kind of leader and pastor to turn the church around. And so they're stuck. And we're seeing this all over the country. In 1997, as a youth pastor in Huntington Beach, California, Pastor Matt Brown shared a dream with his boss to plant a church where people could be real with themselves, God, and others. He left that meeting without a job and a check for two weeks severance. Matt, along with his wife Tammy and their infant daughter, decided it was an opportunity to reconnect with friends from their college days at Cal Baptist University and start the church that they had always dreamed about. That summer, Matt and Tammy met in their living room with eight other people to begin the process of planting what is now Sandals Church, a place where people could be real, sharing the ugliest parts of themselves and be loved and accepted. How beautiful are the feet that bring the good news became the founding verse. And as God brought more people who connected with his vision of authenticity, Sandals Church grew. Literally, God has just blessed this ministry, blessed this movement, and we just have seen thousands of lives that were changed because authenticity allowed God to change my life and change my life and my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my kids and my friends, and it's been absolutely incredible. For North Point, the reality of how desperate things had become began to sink in. Attendance was down, which meant the weekly giving was less than expected. The bank was hinting that an ultimatum was coming. Give up and hand the bank the keys to the building or sell the property. It was during this time that Paul's son, Chris, joined the staff to help his father. 
on the strengths finder, my son is an activator which means he's kind of a let's do it, let's start, let's go, and we'll figure it out as we go. I'm like, man, we don't ever need a building. Like, we can just go, we can meet in fields, and we can do it. I was young and idealistic. I'd be saying, hey, let's think about this, and my son would be chomping at the bit, and Chris would be like, no, Dad, we've thought about it enough, and it's time to make a decision, let's go. And eventually we ended up in an Elks Lodge, 20 people a week, it was terrible. A lot of people didn't come with us, that they really kind of liked the church building and property. And so uh, the church struggled. Um, I remember a Sunday morning, a young man in the church or a um, guy came up to me and he walked up and he said, hey, Chris, he said, when do we close our doors? The blessing and the curse of a small church is, is you know everybody and everybody knows each other and you know their life and their story and you're all together and you're just working and helping and everybody's got some duty covered and that's great. But at some point in time, you realize, we're all getting older. There's no younger people here. That we're not, you know, we're not doing anything. We're not reaching anybody else for Christ. It's just we're kind of ministering to ourselves. My husband and I and a few others did pretty much everything at the church, and uh, we can't do that anymore. We're getting a little bit too old for that. It's great to have keys to all the doors and know where everything is and, and really feel part of it. I mean, we've got we've got our handprints in the concrete under the carpet and you know in the, the main hall there. I mean, it's you know it's it's important. But at some point you have to realize, you know, how's God gonna use this facility? How's God gonna use this church? And I was sitting in my office listening to Pastor Matt and the anchor theory. I just had this feeling that I needed to go out and I walked out to my husband in the other room and I asked him, do you think we should call Sandals? I just felt it in my heart that we should call. I, I feel like it was God's voice telling me to call. In a matter of time, North Point moved back to the original property, but not without paying a price. The credit union was willing to come to the table with some options to refinance their loan, but with a new ultimatum. They would only fund the loan with one pastor on staff. With the future of North Point and its people as his priority, Pastor Paul stepped down and his son Chris took the helm. We were about 80 people or so at that point. We had just been back from the Elks Lodge about a year trying to figure out how to make things happen here. Chris was constantly reaching out to try to try to get some help, get some understanding, like what can I do to grow? What can I do this? Then it was Peggy from KSGN talked to Chris and was like, hey, so we've got this idea. So doing what I always do, do it scared, I dialed that phone number. And I said, you don't know me, but I really believe that you can make a difference here. So I told her, I'm on a mission trip and, and I'll, uh, I'll meet with you when I get back. And so we went and we sat and we talked. So he came to KSGN and for three hours we chatted and started sharing about my city, the crazy brokenness. She said, I attend Sandals Church. Have you ever heard of it? Said, yeah, once or twice. Um, and she said, uh, Pastor Matt has been sharing his vision of, of 500 churches and more campuses. And she said, this is the first time I've ever attended church outside of my city. I live in San Bernardino and I'm attending Riverside and I want to be able to attend church in my city and I'm a connector, I connect people. I haven't talked to anybody about this yet, but I wanna see if you might be interested in connecting with Sandals to become a Sandals campus in San Bernardino. I thought, okay, I I'll have that conversation. and. And so I set up a lunch at Olive Garden, and I felt like a fly on the wall. These guys are talking, you know, and then I had to leave it. Peggy and I and John Brown and Jeremy McAllister sat at uh, Olive Garden, and John just shared the plan. This is our desire to partner with churches. So I went home, I prayed on it for two weeks. We got together again for lunch. Um, I said, John, I really appreciate the offer. I really love sandals, I love what you're doing. I said, I've been lead pastor now for four months. Things are happening, we're growing. I don't think it's the right time. And so I told him no. Um, and in that moment, John looked at me, he said, Chris, he goes, I completely understand that. He said, but I love you and, and I wanna see this church succeed. He said, can I just walk with you guys through this next season and, and make available to you anything we can to help? And my first thought was, sure you will. I just told you no. I'm not gonna hear anything again. And lo and behold, two weeks later, John calls me, hey Chris, can you do lunch? And two weeks after that, hey Chris, can you do lunch? We didn't talk about merging. We talked about me, talked about my growth. We talked about the church.
Literally, there are thousands of churches just like this, struggling, struggling to pay their bills, struggling to meet the needs of the people who still call this church home, struggling to reach their community, struggling to keep up with literally dilapidated facilities that need so much time, attention, care, and resources. And a lot of people in churches like this are just saying, what can we do? What, what do we still have to give? Is, is God done with what we've done here? And the reality is no. And let me just tell you why, because there are churches that are thriving and God is doing amazing, amazing things through, and they have resources, they have inertia, they, they have momentum, they, they have all kinds of vision that literally if they could come together, those two things together could do way more. And so churches like this, they have an opportunity to be stewards of literally all the sacrifices that have people have made for decades in churches like this to take these resources and say, God, we're not done with the investment that we've made for the kingdom. And together with momentum and vision and resources, we can take literally the hearts and passions of generations past and join with generations present that are doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. Because the reality is struggling churches and thriving churches can do way more together when we partner together for the kingdom of God. North Point continued to try and work through their circumstances, but to no avail. As alarming as the call in the middle of the night regarding the arson fire, Chris received a call that was just as devastating. And then I got a call from the credit union, and they said, Chris, we're not going to renew your loan on the building from the fire. They just said our assets and our income do not justify the loan that we're looking for. And so we can't give you this next, uh, you know, two years or five years. And I have no clue what would happen. And it was our job as board members to make sure that the ministry continued and our backs were against the walls. Knowing that they had no choice and no means to repay the bank, foreclosure of the property was imminent. Chris and the board decided to go forward and start the process to become a Sandals Church. What I want to encourage pastors, uh, search committees, boards to do is to think creatively. Maybe the path forward is through a partnership. Maybe the path forward is through merging with another church, a church that can bring in resources, leadership, vision, and a, and a model of doing ministry. And that partnership is what it'll take to revitalize the church. San Bernardino is one of the most violent cities in America and ministry leaving there is a terrible thing. But Sandals coming in and doing that allows that ministry to continue for the next generations. And so that hopefully God will be able to make a massive impact on the city. I think the church in America literally is, is struggling because there's a vacuum of leadership. A lot of guys love God, they know about a lot about the Bible, but they're not great leaders. And so really what we need is leaders. And so I think of the verse in the Bible where it says, the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what to do. And I think God has given me a vision, A, to understand the times, and B, to say, okay, here's our strategy moving forward. A lot of people, when I first started off, they were opposed to the vision of being real. Life is about being real. Every, everything is about being real in your marriage, in your relationship with work, your kids, with God, with yourself. And we literally live in a delusional time where we can lie to ourselves and it's destructive. You can never become who you're supposed to be if you're not honest. I met with our executive team and I said, we've got uh, two major barriers to scaling and growing the way I think that God wants us to scale and grow. The first barrier was it was a, a financial barrier. We had a much bigger vision for, uh, than the resources that we had to reach that vision. And then the second barrier was people. We didn't have trained pastors and trained worship leaders who are ready to take on all these new locations, churches, and campuses. And so that's why we created the Rogo Foundation. And the Rogo Foundation is focused on two things, people and places. And the people side of that is training pastors on how to do ministry at Sandals Church and training pastors on the culture and DNA of Sandals. So the foundation ultimately pays pastors and worship leaders to train and learn our system and our culture. The second thing that the foundation does is, is about places. And that is uh, where we're revitalizing local churches to be growing and thriving by putting in our leadership team, by putting in our, our system, our methodology of ministry. Revitalizing and replanting churches is really important to the Rogo Foundation because we recognize that so many churches are struggling with figuring out how to reach people today. The way that the local marketplace changes over time, the way that the makeup of the community changes and evolves over time, 
the culture shifts every 10 to 15 years and it shifts radically. When we think about the Generation Z that's coming up now, a very different generation from the generations of past. Many churches will look at uh, the way we did it in the 80s worked and we're gonna keep doing it the same way. And the problem with that is that it doesn't work the same. Uh, the message stays the same. The message of Jesus stays the same, uh, but the delivery vehicle has to change. The history of Amethyst and Redlands Bible Church was never lost in that whole process. The first time we met, they charted out the history of the church. They asked us questions about how did you start? Where did you come from? Where did you move next? What, you know, how did things change? And, and so we talked about that for an hour and really laid out a picture, even for us, of what the church had been all about. It felt very respectful. It felt like, okay, there's, you, you've accomplished something here as this group of believers in this small church and you've built this building and you've made commitments and you've financed it and you know, when nobody else thought you could. And they respected that and understood that and then started to talk about, you know, what's the vision? Where do we want to go and, and how do we accomplish that? And, and I think it really helped us feel better about you know, you, you pray that God would do something to change the circumstance and, and bring more people. And then here comes this church that says, we can do this. There is nothing like walking onto a church property and the church seeing it uh, where it's falling apart in its current state, where we're beginning the conversation with the pastor, with the elders about a potential merge. And then seeing the, the merger happen some months later, seeing the remodel happen, and then we open the doors that next weekend and seeing just something come alive. I mean, it is incredible. We want to see this revitalization happen across the country, and uh, we're committing uh, all the resources we absolutely can to make it happen. Launch day was so exciting. We went from 30 people to 600 people in a matter of a week. It was so exciting and it's still thrilling. You pray that God would do something to change the circumstance and, and bring more people. And then here comes this church that says, we can do this, you know, we're, we're doing it now. And we've got hundreds of people out in this area already that are just looking for a campus. And, and so it, it, it got really exciting. But the sensitivity to our feelings was palpable. It was there all the time and, and very carefully done. And, and so that, that really sold me um, on Sandals as an organization who knew how to not just gobble you up, you know, as part of a growth spurt, but to really look for, you know, the connection and, and the philosophy and, and vision of, of reaching people for Christ. And, and it came together and it just, it felt very natural to us. To be standing in this room, seeing what God was doing, I was just blessed and, and excited to see what's gonna happen next. And you know, here's the whole stage and the lights. The worship team got up and they began to worship. And when they began to worship and I felt the energy in the room and I just felt the spiritual life and the unity and to be really simple, I just felt Jesus. And when I felt that energy in this room where I had preached for 21 years, I literally just knelt down right where I was. I just knelt down and cried. Hardest thing to do, but the best thing to do is get yourself out of the way. You know, the, it's God's church, it's Christ's church. It, we need to, to look for his leading in what we're doing. The world needs Jesus, but the way they find Jesus is in the church. The church is the hope of the world, and it's changed my life, it's blessed my kids, it's saved my marriage. You know, Sandals Church is my family. Like, I love these people. I close uh, almost every service with these words, I love you. I love you, Sandals Church, God bless you. And that's because I do. And I think that's what the church is supposed to be, God's body on earth, just loving His people. And the church has been such a wonderful thing for me in my life, and I wanna share that with people. It's, it's like having a front row seat to a miracle. I get a little emotional, but it's, it's been amazing to, to pray so hard for something. You don't know how it's gonna happen. And then God actually does it in a way you never could have imagined. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So it, it's just, it's been stunning to see the number of people and 
the growth from the community itself, not just all existing Sandals members who said, oh, this is closer to home, I'll go there, but there's been a large percentage of growth there over the last couple of years that are, that are people out of Mentone and Redlands and you know coming you know, for the first time. That's been amazing, and I guess it, it helped me learn that you know you, you can't pray big enough for what God's able to do sometimes, and, and that's what happened out there. Throughout the whole Bible, we see the grand design of God is to dwell among and within His people. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he acknowledged that even the highest heavens cannot contain God. Yet he humbly asks that God come fill this place. And it is here, among his people and within the hearts of those who love him, where God receives pleasure and honor. A well-built structure or a well-built life is empty if God does not dwell within. When the temple was left in ruin, God tells his people they must rebuild. It was not about restoring a building to its former glory, but rather giving God a place for His glory to be displayed. He tells His builders in Haggai chapter 2, Be strong, all you people still left in the land, and get to work, for I am with you. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised. God is in the business of restoration. Everything He does is with that purpose in mind. He tells us there is nothing He can't make new. It is through the restoration of God's people and God's dwelling place that His plan is made complete. For this reason, Rogel Foundation's mission is to see God's glory come fill people and places. With each new project, our prayer is simply, Lord, come, fill this place, and dwell here. So here's what I want you to do. As you drive around your local community, I just want you to take a look at a number of churches that were once thriving places of worship, but now they're desolate. They're literally, their playgrounds are empty, and the parking lots have nobody in them, even on Sundays. Look, Sandals Church and the Rogo Foundation, we've come together because that breaks the heart of God and it breaks our heart. And we believe that those churches can still have an impact for generations in the future. We invite you to join our efforts so we can see one less church close its doors. Look, if you're a person who's been blessed by God and you care about the church and you wanna make a financial donation, I would encourage you to do that. If you know of someone who has a church facility or some kind of asset that could be devoted to this kingdom building project, then that would be something incredible. Or if you're just a pastor and you're struggling, wondering if this is the next step for your future and your church's future ministry, let's begin the conversation today.